New Zealand. This group of islands in the South Pacific is the remnant of a sunken prehistoric continent. We'll be crossing South Island. It's the largest and least populated, teeming with exuberant vegetation. Peter Geen used to be a farmer. He's traded in his tools for paintbrushes. He has set up his studio near some of the most stunning sights and travels the country to capture the light, settings, and impressions. Dave Down spends a good deal of his time poking around the riverbeds of the Hokitika region, his practiced eye on the lookout for jade stones. This experienced jade hunter has a passion for these stones and hoards them like a treasure. Stewart Island off the south coast numbers 400 inhabitants. Ferhana Ahmad is one of them. This young woman who talks with the birds was born in Kenya, grew up in England, and was an accountant before settling here in the roaring 40s. I've traveled to a number of different places and lived in a number of different countries. And I just think it's a place of complete timeless beauty. It's a place that um, I'm really lucky to have found. Aote Aroa. In Maori, this means land of the long white cloud. This is the name the Maoris gave this unknown, uninhabited land when they came here from Polynesia about 800 years ago. After the early Maoris, it was a long time before other men reached this island far from anywhere. The first Europeans, the Dutch, arrived here less than four centuries ago. They named this country New Zealand, after a maritime province of the Netherlands. This island, along with the Antarctic, is one of the last great territories discovered by man. This young land, with its short history, was preserved from human activity for a long time, which is why the wildlife in New Zealand is particularly rich, lush, and beautiful. Golden Bay. This is where Abel Tasman, the first European to land here, dropped anchor. There was also James Cook. With its 15,000 kilometers of coast, New Zealand is a land of mariners and sailing. Peter and his wife Kerry are out paddling on Golden Bay in the early light of dawn, but they're not doing it just for the exercise. Peter captures sensations. He seizes the different lights, reflections, and all the expressions of nature that he will rework later. I take all the pictures I can, I just, because it's a digital camera, and when I get home, I then put them onto my laptop and, uh, and start whittling them down and refining and refining and refining until I finally see a, a photo that um, I think could make a good painting and then um, and just watch it grow. The reason I like that scene um, is mainly because it's, it's a rock, um, it's solitude, it represents solitude, it's solid, it represents age, it's, you know, uh, been in all weathers and there's just something nice about it and how it just sits there, ref you know, um, reflecting and um, yeah, it's just nice and peaceful and sort of, yeah, it's a bit how I feel sometimes. <laughs> it's a fantastic place to go, yes. Yes, you can always go around there and be guaranteed a, a painting from a trip around there in the kayak, that's for sure.
I try to change the mood in the painting. I think that's probably what I do from the photograph. And um, it's, it's my interpretation of what that photograph is. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. New Zealanders are very ecology-minded, and Peter and Curry are good examples. Their garden is thriving. The earth is generous. The climate, ideal. Mostly, probably about 90% of our food we grow ourselves. Hey, girls. It's a great, healthy lifestyle. It's a good way to eat, to eat food that um, hasn't travelled any distance. Um, we grow it ourselves without the use of sprays. So yes, it's, it's a good feeling to eat good, clean food in an environment where we grow it ourselves. And it's all under control. Organic, yes, but all the plants have to toe the line. Nothing out of line in this bucolic setting laid out by Peter and Kerry. For a long time, they themselves were producer of organic fruit and vegetables, first in Australia, then in New Zealand. It seems they've completely tamed the nature here. When you go to the supermarket, the food doesn't look like food anymore, not like the food that we used to, or our grandparents used to eat. It's hardly recognizable as food because there are so many ingredients in the food that I can't even pronounce and it's a real paradox that um, we know more about food and nutrition than we've probably ever known in the world and yet there's more sickness, there's more obesity and heart disease and cancer and um, yeah we wonder if it's not being caused by what people eat. That slow food revolution, <laughs> it's grow the food as well as prepare it yourself sit down and enjoy it and honour the food that you eat. Um, we prepare it as close as possible to Mother Nature has presented it to us. Peter worked the land for 25 years. Then he put away his farming tools for good and took up the paintbrush. He transformed his hobby into a full-time activity. Peter regularly leaves his studio to head out on field trips, two or three days on the road in search of the most beautiful spots. And here, he's certainly spoiled for choice. Well, a field trip is, is basically information gathering. It's a, a way of getting out into the environment and, and living in the environment and smelling the environment and, and, and what have you, and absorbing the environment the necessary ingredients to, to take back to the studio to, um, to work with. There's still a few spots out there yet to be discovered, but um, there's a lot of places that uh, we have been, that's for sure. blues out there today you've got the warm blue in the sky and the cooler blue on the in the estuary and um, yeah I think uh, yeah two colors of blue like that in, in, in one image is, is really a real treat and uh, yeah and they've got the contrast of the orange on the on the cliffs and uh, yeah there's some lovely color out there today New Zealand is a vast country but you only need to go a few dozen kilometers to find yourself in a totally different landscape. From the sea to the mountains, the transition is quite abrupt. It's very dry, isn't it? Mm. 
And each time, the surprising settings take the traveler on a voyage through time. It's in its raw state and it's, it's very natural. The landscape can tell me a lot um, and I can get a lot of ideas and I can add that to other paintings that I do. It's just been left alone and it's happened over a long, long period of time. And uh, if you leave it alone and let it go and do its own natural thing, it'll look beautiful one day. The entire west coast of South Island gets heavy rains. Between downpours, the sky clears up, and the sun pours down into these valleys of the rainforest thick with tree ferns. Nature offers the painter a rich palette of greens. Peter's camping car serves as his second studio. And Peter and Kerry have been traveling like this ever since they met. The camping car even played an important role when they first met. Well, that wasn't in New Zealand, actually. That was in Australia. Kerry was um, cycling from Tasmania up to uh, Queensland, and uh, I was traveling on my own in a uh, Volkswagen Combi. And uh, we met, and um, suddenly the, the bike got sold, and. Uh, we started traveling in the combi, and uh, we've been together ever since. Uh, we've always worked together, um, we've always been self-employed, and uh, we, we enjoy each other's company profusely, and um, yeah, we love each other very much. A bit of erosion up there, though. Yeah. I think Peter needs uh, a break so he can get into the environment and I like to come with him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he needs to get out and I think he sees almost every time he goes on a field trip, he comes back full of inspiration. He's got to get into a painting really quickly. So, yeah, it's good for him. I can't believe it. You see anything? No. Hmm. We're looking for New Zealand power or abalone, but uh, there doesn't seem to be much here today. We may have to trek down to the other end of the beach. Ah, luck. Gary? <laughs> the abalone is a strange marine gastropod that spends its life stuck fast to the rocks. The inner side of its ear shaped shell is covered with beautiful and valuable nacre. Is that, Peter, is that long enough? But here, yeah. Peter is after its delicious flesh. Abalone are plentiful here on the west coast of New Zealand. That should be enough. Turn it over and check the size. Yep. And Peter's little escapades always finish in the same way with the painter alone before his canvas, working doggedly for days and days to distill the images stored in his head. A photo will only capture a certain amount of information that I require, and um, I'll further that 
um, and that's, that's the advantage of doing a field trip. So um, I bring the landscape to me. I enjoy being in, 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 the, in the natural environment and I certainly have a, a great appreciation for it, um, particularly the undisturbed uh, natural environment and, and by that I mean uh, environments that haven't been modified by man, you know. Um, I mean a tree like this for example is living a pretty tough life as you can see, you know, its face is into the wind and it's getting a pretty hard time and, and I think that's um, deserving of some sort of recognition I suppose. So um, that's really uh, why I paint a subject like this. Peter's high-definition landscapes, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between reality and the painting. Peter has chosen to portray what is beautiful, naturally beautiful. And such is his love for his models that he always tends to sublimate these images of nature that he is so fond of. I like to come on site and bring the painting back towards the very end of the painting process. Um, it certainly helps put some truth and honesty into the painting. Um, sometimes it's uh, quite difficult because the paintings are big and the easels are big and I've got to lug all my equipment to the site and if it's a long way away it's, uh, it's quite a mission but um, sometimes final touches that you see the most so um, it is important. Peter Geen is now a recognized artist in his country. But this regionalist painter, as he calls himself, is above all happy to have fulfilled his dream, to live for painting and to continue to take delight in the impressive variety of these landscapes. The west coast of South Island faces the Tasman Sea. The banks of clouds that form in the middle of the Pacific roll in from the northwest. The west coast is virgin territory, pioneer country. A hundred and fifty years ago, this hostile region wild and practically uninhabited, was the scene of a sudden massive influx of migrants. When prospectors discovered huge nuggets of gold here in 1860, the news spread like wildfire. From one day to the next, tens of thousands of people from all over the world flocked to this west coast to try their luck. Towns popped up like mushrooms, with their saloons, hotels, brothels, and tradesfolk that followed in the wake of the prospectors. They even quickly built the dock in Hokitika for the many boats bringing in new arrivals. The California gold rush had already petered out, so New Zealand appeared as the new Far West. And so many came, all lured by dreams of riches. In a few years, the West Coast was transformed, ravaged, and a good number of valleys were leveled by the miners who laid waste to entire hillsides in their quest for the coveted gold.
And as always, the fever eventually dropped, almost as abruptly as it had broken out. Now there are still a few active mines, but the fantastic nuggets weighing several kilos are a thing of the past. Gold no longer fires the imagination. However, there are still some people who search the rivers of the Hokitika region. Well, if you don't care to get wet, it doesn't matter. See, them rocks are slippery, aren't they? You've got to be really careful. But the water's nice and clear, though. Grab that view, Al. You see how it breaks the water? Today, Dave Downs has brought his grandchildren along with him. This young, attentive grandfather wants to share his quest with them. Oh, looking for Ponemu, Greenstone. Just gets washed down on the hills and into the river. When it rains and it floods, it comes up real high. You can see along the banks how high it will get, and it turns it over like a washing machine. So you've got more chance of finding the stone once it's turned over. It's really good. But when it's on the bank, it dries out and it just looks like the normal stones. But when it's wet in the river, it's a bit easier to find. I think so. No, that's a big chip. See that rat? Yeah. That's soup. Yeah, it's a tradition. It goes down through the generations of children. If we don't teach them the outdoors, they won't go the outdoors. They TV, you know, video games. The region of Hokitika is the place in New Zealand to find jade. For the untrained eye, these thousands of stones all look alike and the ordinary hiker could pass through here without noticing the rare stone. Dave, however, is always on the lookout. No, look at that. Yeah. See it? Have a look. What do you think? And Dave certainly has a sharp eye. You see how it's grey white? Hold that down. See it, right? Look at that. See it? Oh. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at the green in that. We might make your meaty out of that, eh? What do you reckon? Yep. Feel how heavy that is. I'll hold that. Got it? Pretty heavy, eh? Yeah. Feel it? It's just luck. A lot of luck's involved. The more time you come, the more chance you've got to find in the stone. And that's all it is. Luck and time. Dave loves stones so much, he surrounded his house with them. But the most surprising thing is out in his shed. This is where he keeps his treasure. 20 years of collecting jade stones. Stones he loves so much, he doesn't even cut them open to see how pure they are. He lets them keep their mystery. His whole fortune and history is contained in these piles of jade stones. It's a passion. It's a passion. These browns, greens, the browns are beautiful. These are very, very rare stones. You see the brown crust in those. These... This is a beautiful Arahura chip. Look at the colour in that. It's marvellous. When I first started, it was be for the commercial side of it. I was going to make a lot of money on it. Then I cut a few. I've still got them. I haven't got the money for them. Something grabs you and draws you into the stone. 
It's not just the it's not just a Mary thing, it's not just a mouldy thing. It's just the stone. Of course it's a treasure, isn't it? You've been on the river looking for treasures. Yeah, there's another one. So once you cut it, you just turn it into a rock. It's not Ponemu. It hasn't got the character. You have to go out, you have to get in the environment and feel the tanga, I think the Māori call it. Jade has been present in this region since the dawn of time. As a result of geological transformations, jade deposits formed deep within the earth. When the Southern Alps were formed by upthrust just inland of the west coast, the deposits of jade were lifted to the Earth's surface. Much later, the glaciers carried the stones towards the valleys and towards the sea. And when the glaciers began to melt, they deposited these stones in the riverbeds of the west coast. The first Maori to land on this island named it Te Wai Punamu, which means waters of greenstone, or land of jade. This green stone played an essential role in their life. They used it to make jewelry and weapons, and they considered this stone as a link with their ancestors. It had not only material value, but also great spiritual value. Since the arrival of the Maori, a great quantity of jade has been gathered from the rivers and along the beaches. Now, no one knows exactly how much is still left in the rivers. The deposits have been scattered to many different spots. But even today, the Maori have managed to preserve the traditional methods. The jade must always be collected by hand. Dave works in a dairy to feed his family. Milk is New Zealand's white gold. Jade cutting is not his profession, just a side job. And when Dave cuts jade, he works with stones that he buys from other collectors, just so he never has to touch his personal collection. And yet, here, Dave is cutting the stone he has just found in the river. He has a good reason for making this exception today. This is a gift for my grandson. It's a meri that the Maoris used to use for self-defense when they were first out here. Because the stone is so hard, you can get a fine shape to it and becomes a good, sharp weapon. This will be just for show. Dave, who has Irish roots, has been a New Zealander for two generations. He's interested in the history of this jade that's so important for the Maori. Let's go, lay low. When he's not searching the riverbeds, Dave spends his free time with the Kiwis, one of Hokitika's two rugby teams. Relax. Rugby is a veritable social and cultural phenomenon here. And again, we find the mark of the Maori culture in the haka, the impressive warm-up routine made famous by the All Blacks. For Dave, rugby is like his stones, a fervent passion. He used to play himself, 
Now he's a trainer slash physical therapist and all-round loudmouth for the Kiwis. <laughs> jersey, you play for your club, your jersey. It's, you put it all on the line. All these boys work all week out on the rugby field. That's their time out by themselves. That's the man stuff from when they're little. Yeah, we won. 36, 28. We should have got 50. We've still got a bit of work to do. But this is the derby. This is the main game of this round so far. They're the top team. We just took them out. Dave is a perfect example of what they call here the West Coast spirit. A tough spirit, sometimes a bit rough around the edges, but as genuine as the region itself. Dave has his own secret hunting grounds, and he sometimes has to hike for hours to reach them. This quest for jade is not as obsessive as the gold fever that afflicted thousands of adventurers 150 years ago. But Dave does always feel the irresistible urge to follow the river all the way up to its source in search of that special rare stone. There's a piece of rubbish. No color in it, but it's a bit of stone. His passion for these stones seems boundless, and no bed of rocks, no matter how large, can dampen his enthusiasm. This is the Kuwaka, but the water runs under the loose rocks. And as you get up around the corner up there, you, the water's in there. And it must go under the ground and then down and out into the Arahura River. When it's in flood, it's way up on the banks. I found rocks down here, big brown ones, 20 pound. But that's after the flood. We might be a couple of days late. But you don't know. Doesn't matter, does it? <sighs> Ponum is a bonus, you know. Don't get me wrong, it's good to find the Ponum. That's, but you know, look at it. It's a lovely day. What else would we be doing? You've got to get away from work. Yeah. It's lovely, peaceful. Just getting to Stewart Island is already an adventure. Whether it's by boat or in the small airplane that makes the connection, the crossing to this region off the coast of South Island is a real expedition. The currents are strong and the ocean is rarely calm. And the winds are as free as the air. Stewart Island is so wild that the first ones to greet the visitor are the albatross. Do they come out of boredom, idle curiosity, or to see if there's some kind of snack for them? A bit of all three, probably. At 47 degrees south, Stewart Island is right in the heart of the roaring 40s. Nobody spends too much time here. Even the clouds seem to be in a hurry. Furhana Ahmad came to live in this wild paradise 14 years ago. She knows a good deal about the wildlife of Stewart Island. She knows the stories that come along with each different plant and tree. 
This vine here is called supplejack and um, you can see the top, it looks like asparagus, like a head of asparagus. And Maori used to eat it. They used to break it and eat it and it tastes like a green bean. And uh, when they couldn't find running water, they used to cut stems of this, break it and drink the sap. And as the vines became older, um, like this, Māori used to weave them and make fishing baskets out of them. Furhana is 47 and has had a rather interesting life. She was born in Kenya. Her father was from India and her mother from the Seychelles. She studied business and geography in England and worked for about 10 years as an accountant in London. Then one day she turned her back on all that and decided to travel. I came to New Zealand 16 and a half years ago and I did a lot of hiking from the North Island, South Island and in Stewart Island. And I spent quite a number of years walking by myself in the forest and just watching and listening. Living in New Zealand um, gives you the encouragement to learn and find out more. So I did a lot of my own research. After several years of backpacking, Furhana decided to settle on Stewart Island. In fact, she couldn't go any further. Continuing southward, the next stop would have been the Antarctic. This is what Stewart Island roughly looks like. It's our third largest island. This is the west coast and the southern side and then the Neck Peninsula, Patterson Inlet, 93% of this island is conservation land. It's in wilderness, it's uninhabited. 5% of Stewart Island around here is Maori land. And Maori arrived in Stewart Island in the 13th century, but they haven't lived here all the time. 2% of Stewart Island, mainly through here, is land available for private ownership and there's only 28 kilometers of road. There's 750 kilometers of fabulous coastline. It's an amazing place. Stewart Island is about 65 kilometers by 40, with only 400 inhabitants. And it's not an easy island to get to know. From the air, it's possible to get a view, if you can dodge the downpours and gusts of wind. Coming in from the sea, you're often faced with a rather uninviting coastline. The only way to penetrate this territory is to hike for days and days, being careful not to stray from the paths, for the forest is impenetrable. Here, the vegetation definitely has the upper hand. This vegetation even seems to be gaining ground, waves of branches and roots encroaching on the sea, and not the contrary. This primeval forest is a thick tangle where everything that wants to grow finds a way to thrive. By dint of reading and accumulating knowledge, Furhana has managed to become an expert on her adopted land. She has even made it her job and works as a guide for people who want to discover the region. This is a beautiful example of a lichen 
and a lichen is a plant that's made up of a fungus and an algae and um, the fungus makes the structure and the algae helps to make the food so they grow very very slowly. You can find this lichen throughout New Zealand um, it's very common and we call it um, a, a sample of a folio leafy lichen. Yeah. It's hard not to get lost in this maze of vegetation, beaches, and paths. For Hannah knows this island like the back of her hand, yet she feels as if she's learning something new every day. This plant is called the mutton bird scrub, and it's very soft underneath. It's almost like leather. And the visitors used to write on the back of these leaves. They put a stamp, addressed them, and wrote a note. And the local postmaster would get these leaves, and he used to send them on. The softness of these leaves were favoured by both the Maori and the Europeans. When they went into the forest, they used this as toilet paper, and it worked very well. That's a tui, and the tui is a native New Zealand bird. And it's got a beautiful range of songs. It's got two vocal cords. And once again, the Roaring Forties are playing their favorite symphony for wind instruments and percussion for winds blowing in gusts, for winds whistling in the branches, for the squalls that whip up the sea as if urging the waves to play even louder. Stewart Island is an open-air theater where the elements are forever performing the same show. And they hardly ever take a day off. Quite a bizarre spot to live all year round. In summer, there are visitors that come to admire the natural beauty of the island. But in winter, it's another tune. After you've lived in the big cities of Europe, the one and only village of Stewart Island seems like a magical spot at first. Then you have to be able to make a life for yourself there. It seems that wasn't much of a problem for this former Londoner, for Hannah's house is so small we can't even visit it except from the outside. This is my wilderness chateau. It's very enjoyable being inside, whether it's a 10-bedroom chateau or a one-bedroom chateau like mine. When the wind is outside and the rain is outside, inside it's your castle and it's really nice and warm. <laughs> it's just in here. <laughs> yeah. Comfort is in the mind. Uh, I've got everything I need um, for the moment. Um, I can read books, I can visit friends, and I can enjoy the birds in my garden and the plants in my garden. And I have the best duvet that you can buy on the market. So, um, yeah, I'm warm, I'm happy, and I've got this wonderful forest around me. And I'm being kind to the environment. For Hannah has turned her back on what she calls the concrete jungle and the rat race, quoting the titles of two Bob Marley songs. 
Here, the jungle is vegetation, and the only racing we witness is that of the sun and the clouds in the sky. There's some kiwi footprints here on the beach, and the kiwis will feed near the beach or in the forest. And this kiwi has been out early this morning, so we'll try and see if we can find one. A kiwi is a flightless bird. It's one of New Zealand's most ancient birds and our national icon. For Hannah can take us to places where nobody else goes. But even so, there are no guarantees of spotting every single animal. And this time, we didn't manage to see any kiwis. This wingless bird is mainly active at night and is very shy. But there's always some curiosity to catch one's interest. You'd imagine them more in Africa, Central America, or in the Amazon. But there are indeed parrots living in these lands far down in the Southern Hemisphere. It's one of three big parrots in New Zealand. All of these parrots are unique to New Zealand. And the kaka is the forest parrot. This parrot is feeding on the nut from this native tree, which is called Miro. New Zealand's human history is rather brief, and that's surely why natural history is so important to New Zealanders. They have no castles or cathedrals to preserve, but they do have this rich nature to safeguard, and to which they link their history. This is a, a rimu, a very young rimu. They take about five to six hundred years to fully grow. And when Captain Cook and his men sailed around New Zealand's coasts, they used to take the young branches of rimu. They boiled it, added molasses and yeast, and made a beer to stop scurvy. But I don't think it worked. On Stewart Island, even the birds have their papers. Every year, there are major banding operations organized for certain species. And birds that aren't endemic are not welcome. Where are you? We are waiting. <laughs> ah, Robin, Robin. For Hannah is a walking encyclopedia of Stewart Island's wildlife. And she has another particularity. She talks to the birds. Up here, just there, like they showed you at the academy. <laughs> Come on, Robin. <laughs> the Robin likes us because we disturb the ground when we walk, so insects can easily be found. So we call them opportunistic feeders. And the robin is not related to the European robin, but it behaves in a similar way. And its song is very similar. When modern land mammals evolved in the world, they didn't evolve in New Zealand 35 million years ago. And it was only when the Polynesians started to come to New Zealand about a thousand years ago and later the Europeans over 200 years ago that they brought predators for our wildlife. But for millions of years this country remained without predators. So most of our birds are very friendly.
The privilege of living on Stewart Island also means accepting the drawbacks. A rather restricted social life and rather harsh climatic conditions. For Anna's choice was obvious. I think the country that you belong to isn't necessarily the country that you were born in or the country uh, that you were brought up in. It's a country that you choose for um, the things that you value in life. Um, I love the outdoors, I love the natural environment, and for me, this means New Zealand is the right country for me. Yeah.